If you've consumed content on the internet in the past four years, you've likely heard the word unalive. In recent times, this phrase has garnered huge amounts of popularity and widespread use from influencers, YouTubers, TikTokers, and everyone in between. However, this phrase has always sat wrong with me personally, and upon further inspection, is actually much more harmful to internet culture, popular culture, and the general English vernacular than we ever thought. So come with me as I share with you why you should stop saying unalive. To understand why Unalive is even a thing in the first place, we need to look through the conditions who birthed it. YouTube from its inception to the late 2010s was a pretty different place than it is in the 2020s. They were incredibly strict about some things while being super lax on others. Something that was very contentious was the use of inappropriate language. General swear words and things of the sort were not particularly favored by YouTube in the mid-2010s, leading to limited advertisements for many of the YouTubers who swore, whether they were to be child-friendly or not. YouTube was in an awkward phase where they were trying to appeal to advertisers as much as they possibly could after having multiple controversies where thousands of companies pulled their ads, and therefore their funding from YouTube. Such events as the two adpocalypses are great examples of this. YouTube was on damage control, trying to essentially force many of its top creators to be family-friendly. This play was viewed as hypocritical by the general public since it seemed like they were trying to make YouTube a platform for children, despite there being insanely exploitative and inappropriate content such as the first wave of Elsagate alongside the webcam footage controversy already being on the platform with them not really doing anything about it. The YouTubers didn't really have any choice but to conform to YouTube's new stricter policy on monetization and swearing, leading many of the videos to include censor beeps or alternative words, as a means to avoid demonetization. This is one of the first examples of people changing their vocabulary to conform to a company's policies. But was absolutely nothing compared to the mess that we have on our hands now. On July 27th, 2018, YouTuber Pyrocynical uploaded a video by the name of Fortnite Short Film Cringe. In this video, he covers some of YouTube videos that were made using Fortnite Battle Royale's replay mode, where the characters would just be dubbed over by hammy voice actors. These were essentially just a Fortnite version of his old machinima videos, but, you know, uh, bad. In this video, Pyro points out that some of the videos use the phrase game end rather than kill or eliminate. In one of the videos Pyro covers, one of these little Fortnite characters refers to assassinating a character as game ending them. I'm gonna game end him. <laughs> Oh my god! This type of goofy censorship was unheard of at the time, which led Pyro to find it funny and continue to use it in many more of his videos. Even this first Fortnite video he made is now sitting at 3.7 million views, so needless to say, the phrase was seen by many different people. Now from there, users of YouTube and YouTubers themselves would say gay men as a tongue-in-cheek reference to how goofy some people's self-censorship can be, as you've always been able to say kill or die on YouTube. This game end euphemism bled into the real world being used by many unfunny Gen Z band kids back in the late 2010s, becoming a part of ironic meme culture that plagued those who were in their early teens at the time. Trust me, I'm speaking from personal experience. Anyway, from there the term died off, but interestingly enough is still seeing some infrequent use. However, this is with the internet users of today who likely don't know the original context. We'll get to that soon. What must also be addressed is the origin of the phrase unalive. Unalive comes from a pretty unlikely place, being a Spider-Man cartoon from 2013 where Deadpool teams up with Spider-Man for the episode. If you know anything about Deadpool, you'll know that his entire brand is being edgy and raunchy and quippy. Obviously, this isn't fit for a child audience, so the writers of this cartoon took the creative approach, but they made the whole thing kind of meta and played into the restrictions. All this leads to Deadpool delivering this string of dialogue. Yes. We go into that compound, find Agent MacGuffin, snag the list, then unalive Taskmaster and his acolytes, capiche? Wait, unalive them? Yeah, yeah, here's the thing. I can't really say the K-word out loud, it's a weird mental tick. K-word? You mean you want to kill them? Oh, yeah! And yes, we're gonna unalive them. Can't unalive them! Can't unalive anyone in Deadpool! This is where the euphemism comes from but it only saw some mild use in meme culture alongside a subreddit cataloging similar goofy phrases coming from the online game Roblox. As since that game is marketed towards kids, there is some pretty heavy censorship by means of replacing the offending word with pound signs. This leads people to get creative in how they say offending things, such as the iconic Go Commit Die, which is the namesake of this subreddit. This post of a silly Roblox character saying initiate unalive garnered some pretty decent popularity and spread to other subreddits and spread out into the wider web as well. A couple of memes started to use the phrase, but they were usually those I'm so depressed, look at me, 2019 Reddit memes that we all know and... you know. I 
are aware of. However, during this time, a new social media struck the world by storm. What was first thought to be a cheap rebrand musically became so, so much more. With gamers and furries having an all-out war while e-girls lip-synced a Mia Khalifa diss track. Early TikTok was a lot of fun for those who used it, with many regarding it being a sort of reincarnation of Vine. Soon, however, TikTok's popularity started to become annoying to those who weren't users of the platform. The dances, phrases, and sense of humor started bleeding into the mainstream. This alongside the information about TikTok's security and privacy risks started to emerge, leading those who weren't users of the platform to make sure that they never installed it. For those who don't know, TikTok is owned by ByteDance, a Chinese mega corporation specializing in technology. And listen, before I explain anything further, I want to be so crystal clear that everything I say about the Chinese government is strictly about the government and their policy, and does not reflect my opinion on citizens of China or Chinese people in general. This is all about the Chinese Communist Party and nothing else. A large fear within TikTok's attractor base is that all the data that TikTok collects, which is a lot, gets shared directly with the Chinese Communist Party. This has led the United States government to ban use of the app in certain areas, as it fears that it's a security threat. Now, you may be wondering what this information has to do with goofy euphemisms for kill, and we'll get there, trust me. It's no secret that the TikTok of the United States and the TikTok of China are two very, very different things. The algorithm in both respective regions is nearly unidentifiable from each other, with the Chinese algorithm promoting a lot of propaganda, showing people working hard and achieving great things through means of teamwork and belief in the state, while the American one is quick to show its users whatever's going to keep them engaged for the longest, like sexually suggestive content and outrage bait. This leads to more conspiracy-minded people thinking that this discrepancy in content is an intentional attack on the morale of the United States, trying to plunge its youth into degeneracy and hedonism. This theory is more than a little bogus and definitely fear-mongering, and I personally don't really buy it. Regardless, my point in bringing that up is that the Chinese version of TikTok employs heavy censorship and promotes pretty much only what the party wants its citizens to see. To some, it seems like this censorship is completely absent from the American TikTok. However, this is untrue. Many words are grounds for shadow bans on TikTok. For those unaware, shadow bans are a form of censorship on the internet that essentially boils down to blocking a user's posts and content from people, but not actually making the original poster aware of it. Many, many words on TikTok will get you shadow banned. Most swear words and words that could even be slightly suggestive like thick and bean, and especially words that relate to death or the harm of others. However, TikTok users figured out a way around this policing of language around 2021, when, when according to Know Your Meme, some of the first popular videos using the word on a live were uploaded to TikTok by TikTok user CatXHD using a Family Guy audio. Hey, Peter. Hey, what's going on? Is something wrong? No, 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 no. Every, everything's, everything's cool right now. Might be some problems later, but uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Videos like these shot this term into the stratosphere, leading to more and more TikTok users to use the term when describing morbid scenarios. Initially, it seemed to be used more in scenarios where people discuss the taking of their own life, but quickly became just another word for kill or die. This was self-contained on TikTok for a bit, but soon spread to almost every other social media. Instead of gay men's ironic tongue-in-cheek usage, Unalive was used completely earnestly and with a completely straight face by most, in videos that were otherwise serious. Soon enough, this term spread to YouTube, and once it got here, it did not stop. All this happened around late 2021 and throughout 2022. As someone who has been making videos regarding often dark subject matter, I've used the word dead in many, many, many of my videos. So I know from experience that using that word in your video won't get it taken down or demonetized. So to me, the spread of unalive felt like a complete social contagion. For those who don't know, the National Institute of Health describes social contagion as, quote, social contagion is defined as the spread of behaviors, attitudes, and effects through crowds and other types of social aggregates from one member to another. Adolescents are prone to social social contagion because they may be especially susceptible to peer influence in social media. Once you're aware of social contagion as a concept, it's almost impossible to not see it everywhere. This to me feels like a prime example of that very thing. People have no reason to use these censorship-based euphemisms, yet they do because they see other people doing it. However, unalive isn't the only TikTok-based word that's spread to YouTube and the wider internet. Enter sewer slide. A much darker and more insolent version of Unalive is Sewer Slide, and all of its variations. The phrase comes from a VR chat clip where Kermit the Frog jumps off a building, proclaiming that he is going to Kermit Sewer Slide. This clip became popular around 2018, and again was very popular among annoying meme kids, but 
like Game End, kind of died off until its reintroduction on TikTok and YouTube. Now here's the thing, YouTube does actually get very, very touchy when it comes to creators talking about mental health related issues, pertaining to the ending of one's life. I personally saw the effect of it in one of the first videos in my current content style, being part 3 of the Gen Z Childhood Trauma Iceberg videos. It was age restricted because I talked about that creepypasta, Squidward's you know what. Despite multiple appeals, YouTube refused to unage restrict the video, and a mental health warning is shown before you watch the video. So yeah, it's safe to say that YouTube doesn't want you using this word. But the way these people have gone about it is quite possibly the most tone-deaf and disrespectful way that they could. I've heard phrases like committing toaster bath, neck roping, and late fetus deletus, and many other incredibly cringeworthy ways of dancing around an incredibly dark and real issue used all over the place. Now, this wouldn't be a bad thing if it was all in kind of a joking way. But no, many YouTubers discussing real events where actual humans passed away use these phrases and play it completely straight, leading to some incredibly tone-deaf and disrespectful content. Like, imagine you lose a loved one to some horrible event, say it was by means of somebody else, and then you see some hack on YouTube banking off your loved one's death, doing little to no research on the actual case, and saying something like, Guys, it's crazy, this guy was literally unalived in front of everyone that he knew. Charles Smego is one of the craziest examples of someone who is unalived, and people think that he committed sewer slide, but it turns out that might not be exactly what happened. Or... The year was 2012. A guy by the name of Charles Smego was driving on the inner highway after he went home from work. He and was. then, when he was taking a dark turn, his car went over the bridge, and he tragically unalived. No. How did no he unalive? Way. Some people say his unaliving was a complete accident, but others speculate it might have been a sewer slide. Hey, my God. Charles may have died from a sewer slide, but when you look at it further, it turns out his phone may have been hacked by the annoying Orange app. Charles may have been unalive from an app on his phone that took control of the geolocation and GPS abilities. After the police couldn't find his body, it was ruled as a mystery sewer slide. But people really speculate further that it's much more than just that. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not all against true crime content. Not at all. I just believe that it should be made in a way that's respectful and honors the victims of these horrific crimes, not as some spooky gooky story time using TikTok baby words. Here to share the perspective of a true crime YouTuber is my friend Kyle, who you probably know as Dire Trip. It kind of goes without saying that goofy terms like unalive and self-delete are pretty common within the true crime sphere of YouTube. After all, the certain no-no words that these terms are used to censor are bound to come up time and time again when you're talking about things like this. After all, I can't really blame them. Censorship is both rampant and wildly inconsistent throughout YouTube. Some channels can get away with saying kill, while others can't, and that's kind of just the sad truth of it. As your channel grows, you actually get away with saying more things that you couldn't get away with before, which is something that I've experienced on my own channel firsthand. In fact, I remember having to censor out a few words in my early videos that I can just easily get away with saying now. Most people know that this started out with the adpocalypse, and that definitely hit the true crime community pretty hard in comparison to some others out there. Some words that were once perfectly okay to say were now suddenly against YouTube's community guidelines, Lines with no warning and no opportunity to cut them out or censor them. This led to some YouTubers' entire back catalogs being demonetized and essentially losing out on their entire paycheck completely randomly overnight. It's really no wonder that people became kind of afraid of using these words again. However, the problem is really the execution. There are a lot better ways to get around saying words like kill or die without using these goofy terms that kind of add a little element of humor to the whole thing, if anything. Most people find a problem with phrases like unalive not because they don't understand the censorship, but because they don't agree with the way the censorship is being carried out, and I kind of agree with them. Imagine having your kid take their life only to go on TikTok and hear some dude talking about sewer slide or chin gun or one of those things. Even if you aren't offended, these words still really take you out of the story by the completely jarring change in tone when using these words. There are a lot of phrases that could be used in place, like ending one's own life, taking a life, ended it all, various other phrases that don't really take away from the story and aren't quite as goofy. Don't even get me started on words like shot being spelled as sh asterisk t. I mean, come on, you know what you're doing with that one. In the end, it does seem that some platforms like YouTube, I can't really speak for TikTok or any of the others, have been easing up on this to some extent. 
After all, you can't really get away with using words like kill or die within the English language. There are a lot of phrases that use these words like killing time, dead batteries, and you can't necessarily just completely demonetize everyone who uses these terms, but they actually were doing that for a while. I really think that logic is going to win at some point. But for the time being, we might as well make do by using terms that aren't dumb. Alright, awesome. Thank you, Con. Great stuff. Oh, uh, now it's sponsor time. Yeah. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. Whenever you're browsing online on an unprotected device such as a phone, computer, tablet, console, etc., your device is transmitting a great amount of information out into the open, which can be viewed by various different entities before reaching the intended website. A virtual private network, or VPN for short, is an app that hides your IP address and safeguards your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. This way, it shields your digital life from the eyes of those that are looking to exploit your private information. Here's the thing. Whenever you're connected to the internet on a public Wi-Fi network, or at airports, coffee shops, friends' houses, or even at your own home, your data is at risk of being stolen. Hackers that are connected to the same Wi-Fi network have the ability to steal your personal data with ease, including sensitive information such as passwords, keystrokes, and even your photos. Using public internet without private internet access is like eating undercooked chicken. All it takes is one bad batch to get salmonella infection. I'm personally someone who's very passionate about keeping privacy online a guarantee. So private internet access is the perfect sponsor, as I personally use VPNs all the time, and I greatly believe their message. If you wanted to watch a show on something like Netflix, but you just can't because it's not on there, well it turns out that different countries have different Netflixes, and a lot of the time that show that you're looking on is in a different country's Netflix. Let's say you want to watch Spongebob really bad. Go to Canada, boom. Private internet access has got your back. So go to PIAVPN.com slash Raimundo and get an 83% discount on private internet access. That's just $2.03 a month. Alongside that, you get an extra four months for completely free. This is one of the best deals on the market and I highly suggest you check it out. Now back to the video. As mentioned earlier, social contagions are very easy to spread. People are incredibly impressionable. And if they aren't aware of how it all works, are likely being conditioned and programmed by the majority of the content that they consume. I want to be clear that I'm not immune to this myself, and I don't want to act like I'm above these people since I am absolutely not, and I'm a victim of media programming myself. It's just something that you need to be very, very aware of and try to unlearn. And it's definitely a journey and a process to do so, something that I've been trying to do myself. A good thing to start is to think, who gave me this opinion? What influenced me to say or think these things? Do I actually believe them? When you do that, you'll be able to realize how much our media influences us. This is not only online media, but movies, TV, music, all of it has profound impacts on humans, which, again, isn't inherently a bad thing. If the majority of content that we consumed online was positive and, you know, good, then that really wouldn't be an issue. However, it's not. So, you know, that's not good. A good example of this that I've personally noticed is the internet's outlook on Generation Alpha. If you're unfamiliar with the discourse online, people started seeing videos of kids freaking out over goofy things like skibbity toilet and time on their iPads. These few videos determine the internet's collective conscious on the entirety of humanity born past 2012 or 2010, depending on who you ask. The discourse lacked any nuance, and most creators covering the topic were just parroting the same points that other people were saying. I personally made a video on the topic at the start of 2023, and it's one of my best and most popular. And in that video, I take a more sympathetic and in-depth look at the childhoods and struggles that Gen Alpha kids are facing. This video changed a lot of people's minds on the topic, breaking them out of the narrative that had been built throughout the past few weeks of discourse on the topic. This led to future videos on Gen Alpha taking a more sympathetic look into the issue. Now, is this change in perspective because of my video? There's no way that I can know that. But my point is that the influence that YouTubers, TikTokers, and Instagram people hold impacts the general viewpoint of the wider internet and its users. And when you think about it, they're called influencers for a reason. With things like true crime content, it's so normalized to look at real-life tragedies in an apathetic and sometimes even lighthearted way, using this TikTok baby talk to describe terrible things. But if people didn't start doing it and became successful from it, it wouldn't be a thing in the first place. When you look at the wider array of content on the internet, you'll see that so much of it is kind of recycled from each other. Very few videos are made completely originally, and that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Most art is inspired by other things. It's very hard to find things that are truly, truly original. So to me, as long as you're making content with quality that has your own style and unique spin to it, then I see very little issue in inspiration. But what I do think is bad is when creators just kind of recycle topics and content style, and especially when those topics and content style are inherently low quality, and it works, and it's popular, then there's a problem. If content kidifying tragedies wasn't so successful with the first people doing it, then their legion of copycats wouldn't even be making that kind of content in the first place. Something really strange in the niche are mukbangs and makeup tutorial true crime videos. 
this sort of trend has been coined the true crime girly genre, and I can't lie, I'm not a fan. A lot of the time, these videos fall into the same pitfalls of being kind of disrespectful and oftentimes get details of the cases wrong. Again, if it weren't about such sensitive, dark, and real subject matters, then there wouldn't really be much of an issue. But where we stand now, it feels weirdly dystopian. When I was 16, I read a book by the name of 1984, a fantastic novel by author George Orwell, which takes you into a dystopian future where an authoritarian government has complete control over its people. <laughs> I know how this sounds, just bear with me for a bit longer, trust me. The people in this book are under constant surveillance from Big Brother, the propaganda leader of their nation, and cannot speak or even think against their government. The government forces its people to use Newspeak, a dumbed-down and simplified state-approved version of the English language, with the intention to diminish critical thought. Newspeak is something that really, really stood out to me when reading this book, as the concept of the government policing and minimizing its citizens' capability to express themselves is a truly fascinating and well, terrifying thing. Throughout all these different euphemisms for death, the thought of newspeak keeps getting brought up in the back of my mind. Of course, it's a very, very different thing. I'm not trying to say that people saying unalive is literally 1984, but at the same time, the concept of corporations policing discussion of one of life's only promises feels wrong to me. The fact that TikTok's extreme shadow banning culture has infested platforms like YouTube and Instagram that don't even punish you for using words like die is insanely weird to me and it's very, very off-putting. People are basing their vocabulary on the asks of a service owned by the Chinese Communist Party who in itself people claim is the closest thing that we have in our modern world to the governing parties of 1984, with the CCP's constant monitoring, limiting how many children its citizens can have in the social credit system. What's wild to me is that these restrictions that TikTok has placed have bled into the real world, completely independent of the internet. Some people just say unalive and sewer slide in, in real life conversation in a unironic way and it's really really weird and off-putting because I don't want my speech and choice of words to be dictated by an algorithm made to addict and outrage and be earnest and serious with my audience. And in an ideal world we wouldn't have a bunch of conformists to an algorithm that doesn't even govern our platform. And listen, I understand why YouTube has mental health warnings. It makes sense, and the intention is in the right place. But limiting discussion on those topics and forcing people to use words that make it less serious doesn't seem like the right play to me. I could be wrong, and I really, really hope I am. But I can't help but feel like this is a bit of a slippery slope. If we all so easily conform to what mega corporations want us to say and how we communicate our information, then what is stopping them on shadow banning discussion on other topics? How much of our language will become roundabout ways to soften real life things in an attempt to blindsight an algorithm? I personally don't think that English evolving and changing with the time is a bad thing in the slightest. Slang being widespread and heavily adapted is something that is actually really interesting to me, and in a lot of cases I think it's a good thing. However, slang historically hasn't been made to appeal to an algorithm. That's where the difference lays. Because like I said earlier, I've witnessed children and teens using unalive in place of dead in real situations. And hell, I use it myself as a joke. Yeah, I'm right there. Huh? Sorry, that's the unalive. But I know, as well as you, the internet lingo bleeds into the real life. When I was a kid, calling each other noobs became a common playground insult. Words like riz have gotten to the point where even people pushing 50 know what it means. Internet vernacular is essentially real world vernacular, given how interconnected everything is, which proves to me that we have to be careful which words we decide to use and which words we decide not to use. I want to hear what you think. Let this comment section be a place of discussion. I don't want you to conform to my viewpoint. I want you to take all the information that I've discussed and come to your own conclusion. I also want to be really, really clear that I'm not trying to hate on YouTubers who do say unalive and similar things in their videos, as long as they aren't being disrespectful of the dead. If it's harmless, it's harmless. But my video is more so pointing out that it's indicative of a larger trend. The individual creators are in no way to blame in the slightest. I want to be so clear that I don't think that using the word unalive or any others is, is the end of the world or anything like that. However, I do think it's indicative of a larger trend in popular culture. To me, it also shows where people are emotionally headed as a society collectively. What I've noticed is that over the past 20 some odd years, there's been a growing collective apathy towards tragedy. And to me, this makes total sense, because if we were to get completely distraught over the horrible things that happen every day, to every week, to every month at this point, 
we wouldn't be able to function. Now that we have the internet, we're aware of all the awful things happening all across the world, all across the country, and effectively, we don't really have an escape from it. So to me, it seems like the brain has kind of used apathy as a defense mechanism, so we're not constantly distraught and stressed out over everything that's happening. But in effect, it seems like this has led to apathy towards death and murder and all these different things, which really should be still things that you should be respectful when talking about and, and still feel the weight and gravity of. As I know it can be difficult for a lot of people, especially just Gen Z kids growing up in a post 9-11 society where something crazy happens like every other month. It's, it's hard to really be in tune and to be able to fully feel the weight of a tragedy. Again, this is something that I feel many of us can experience. And the thing is too, like I said earlier, I don't blame the individual content creators as long as they're not being disrespectful. And I understand that a lot of the people on TikTok need to say these sort of things, or at least they think that they need to say them, because otherwise they can't talk about these things. And a lot of the time, these are subject matters that should be able to be talked about perfectly openly. But, you know, they aren't. Because ideally, online speech is free, and content shouldn't be shadow banned because a corporation doesn't like what you're talking about or the words that you're using. Now, of course, there are caveats to this. I don't believe that all hate speech and stuff like that should just be able to roam free on the internet, as getting rid of that sort of thing, or at least hiding, is better for the overall populace, as you're not exposing people to hateful ideas that might radicalize them, right? I understand that. But no one's gonna get radicalized, and nothing really is gonna come out of saying that someone died, rather than unalived. You know what? I mean? Because the line for what is okay and what isn't okay should not be drawn by an algorithm or by a mega corporation that owns said algorithm. It gives them far too much power, and if we willingly give that power to them, they will go unchecked with it. Corporations do not care about the little guy, they do not care about you and I, the working man and woman. They only care about the bottom line and whatever will bring the most profit and control of the populace. It's terrifying, yeah, absolutely, but it's reality. And the sooner we all realize that, I think the better. I think that wraps it up for this video. And I hope that it starts a larger discussion on the topic. I want to hear your thoughts, like I said earlier. I hope you all enjoyed this video and came away with something new at the very least. And I also want to thank Kyle for coming on here and sharing his perspective and being my true crime girly as well. That was much appreciated. And I also want to thank Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video once again. I've been Raymundo2112. Think for yourself, and I'll see you all in the next one. Of course, huge thanks to the patrons. Adila Archila, Rogue Reflex, AZZ, Burt Cookie, and Cystics. You guys rock. Thank you very much.